Today, I'm going to be taking a look at the recently released U4S IEM from 64 Audio. I want to give special thanks to Audio46 for supplying me with this review unit. If you want to help support the channel, use the link in the description to purchase the U4S from Audio46 down below. Anyway, as usual, we'll be taking a peek inside of the box, going over the physical and technical design, and finally getting to just what the U4S really sounds like. Now, as many people watching this are likely already aware, 64 Audio operates on the higher end of in-ear monitors. So at $1,099, the U4S is actually 64 Audio's most affordable universal IEM offering. We still see the best of 64 Audio's design principles, from the ergonomic anodized aluminum shell to the TIA tubeless driver tech, but a little more on that in a second. Let's see what comes in the box. You get your 64 Audio U4S IEMs, a hard 64 Audio leather case, True Fidelity foam ear tips, spin fit silicone ear tips, and some more silicone ear tips, a 3.5 millimeter black premium cable, Apex modules, a cleaning tool, and a sticker. Now let's go over the look and the fit. Stylistically, this is nothing unfamiliar from 64 Audio. We have an anodized aluminum shell with its distinct conscious shape, which is basically a staple from the company at this point. And I'm always a fan of the 64 Audio fit. The smooth, rounded edges go a pretty long way in ensuring comfort. The body doesn't really poke or awkwardly strain the outer ear, and also the two-pin side of the included cable is L-shaped, which makes it conducive to having the wire wrap comfortably around your ear. The IEMs are lightweight and fit into the ear canal with about an average depth. Overall, they feel very casual and easy to wear for a long time, and I would say that they are more than a few steps above average in the comfort department. This is a little unsurprising. Like I said, 64 Audio really seems to have this part of things figured out. Now, I won't spend much time on looks, as you can see for yourself. You can form your own opinions, but in my opinion, the U4S has a serious, professional, kind of understated and chic look that you can get away with wearing and still go unnoticed. Now, as I've already mentioned, for physical design, we see an anodized aluminum shell composing the housing. This gives the IEMs great durability and also keeps things lightweight. Now, let's get into technical design because we actually have quite a lot to go over here. We see four drivers in the 64 Audio U4S. One dynamic driver for low frequencies, one balanced armature for low mids, another balanced armature for high mids, and a TIA driver, which is kind of like a six, 64 audio special balanced armature driver, for the highs. Now, an obligatory overview on 64 audio TIA design, which might be more of a recap for a lot of you. Long story short, TIA is a 64 audio patented driver design that does away with acoustic tubes that carry sound from the driver to the output of the IEM nozzle. Instead of tubes, we get a tubeless TIA single bore design and TIA acoustic chambers. The design philosophy here is that sound from the driver should face as little obstruction and resonance risk as possible when traveling towards a listener's ear from the driver. But we see more than just the TIA design defining the U4S. We also see a patented circuit known as LID or linear impedance design. To put what this does in understandable terms, it performs a form of impedance matching and ensures that the IEM's frequency response is staying consistent regardless of the connected audio source. Next up, the electrical low-pass filter, a crossover circuit that replaces acoustic dampers and eliminates unwanted frequencies before they ever even reach the drivers. And now for the fun part of the technical design, Apex. This is basically an air pressure exchange vent which regulates ear canal air pressure and results in less listening fatigue and a more realistic soundstage. This can be adjusted using the included Apex modules that we saw in the box. So let's revisit those now. First, the MX modules, described by 64 Audio as producing the widest imaging but the least amount of noise isolation. Sub-bass response is significantly attenuated here, with amplitude reductions between negative 10 dB and negative 1 dB occurring downwards of 350 Hz. Basically, a fairly significant low-end roll-off. Then the M20 modules, which 64 Audio says are least ideal for imaging, but 
increase sub bass frequencies between 20 and 40 Hz by 1 to 2 dB. Then finally we have the M12 module. Attenuation ranging from negative 1 to negative 4 dB occurs from 130 Hz to 20 Hz. So on that note, I'll be basing this review primarily on my experience with the M12 Apex module, as it was specially made for the U4S, so for obvious reasons, seems like the most appropriate one to use. But anyway, let's get into it now, beginning with soundstage. The size present in the U4S's stage is considerable and extends in every direction, though some a little more than others. The largest dimension the U4S has going for it seemed to my ears to be height. It was common throughout my lessons to hear cymbals, high strings, airy background vocals as emanating from just somewhere above me. Parts were frequently shooting up way above my head, which may not be an outright rare feature for me to experience with IEMs, but it's not particularly common either, and for that reason alone, it was very nice to hear. When it comes to its depth, I felt this dimension the greatest in the U4S's forward-facing image. Mono parts, or even parts only lightly panned to the side, seem to extend a considerable distance from my face and out into the room around me. This isn't the craziest depth I've ever experienced with an IEM, but it's satisfying and more than sufficiently creates distance and layering. Now, what's interesting is I didn't feel a great sense of distance when hard pans were flanking my ears. Instead, I felt a little something else. The U4S has the tendency to send hard pans behind around the back of my head rather than flying far to my side out from the sides of my shoulder. Honestly, I kind of prefer this from behind characteristic a little more than an extreme width. It not only offers more of a spatial, literally in the middle of the music sort of sensation, but imparts a particularly unique 64 audio stage quality to the U4S. For example, this isn't too different from the stage I would describe for the U12T, the U18T, or to really be honest, the, the Forte Blanc. Now let's break down the balance here, once again just mentioning that I used the M12 module here which reduces 20 to 130 Hz by negative 4 to negative 1 decibels. So with those modules in place, bass comes through as firm, fast, and detailed, with an emphasis on the mid-bass. Subs can come rumbling forward with a surprising amount of power for that matter, but they kind of need a mix that demands it of them. With the M12, subs mostly played a supporting role that provided a rumbling energy in the background more than a face-melting earthquake. On electronic tracks where subs play more of a major role, however, such as Jaipal's Crush for example, the rumble is entirely present and realistically powerful, and suggests to me that the bass attenuation with the M12 module is tasteful and not at all overdone. Now as for high bass, which I usually have more than a few words for, the U4S is pretty reserved here. For example, on the bridge of Curve and Light by Midair Thief, the bass player is reaching pretty high up on the neck, playing quite literally high bass notes. However, I didn't hear the thick bassy texture on these notes like I do on most other IEMs, and they instead present it as being more in the mid-range with a little more edge. Now, I definitely wouldn't call the U4S cold or sterile sounding, it's actually pretty far from that, but it's not finding its warmth in boosted high bass amplitudes. This is a quality, however, that is right up my alley, as most days of the week I'll choose the extra clarity and separation that a reserved high bass has to offer over the warmth that risks, you know, muddy textures. And I would say that that's exactly what's going on here. Less fuzz, less warmth, more low-end and mid-range separation. So overall, there is considerable low-end power, but it's not the star of the show. Even taking into account the other customizations that can be made to the low-end amplitude, I would simply describe it as being probably at a kind of like a Goldilocks level. Powerful enough to satisfy pop and electronic listeners, reserved enough to avoid booming on mixes for rock, jazz, classical, or other listeners. Now when it comes to mids, the U4S presents things very naturally with only a touch of coloration in its semi-boosted high mids. Vocals find natural expression in their low mid fundamentals, but find most of their volume in their immediate overtones. Honestly though, it might be a little too much to say that high mids are outright emphasized. I mean, they are, but it's not a quality that immediately jumps out at you. I'm confident that most listeners are going to hear this as simply 
a balanced mids profile, with vocals presenting as extra realistic, and I would even say dryly, if you know what I mean. And if you don't, don't really worry about it too much. The mid-range isn't where the U4S is finding its distinct character. Mostly, this is a mid-range that serves as a sort of anchoring realism for the overall sound signature. Now, where the U4S does find some idiosyncratic and interesting character is in its trouble. And it's not that the U4S has a truly loud or in-your-face treble, it's more like it has a high quantity of treble. Um, let, let me speak more like a normal human being and clarify what I mean by that. Low treble and mid treble are fairly prominent, though not overly so, while high treble reaches far into the frequency response and seems to audibly carry the U4S to 20 kHz. Perhaps the treble sensitive might find mid treble a little much. Guitars, higher piano notes, and vocal reverbs are rich with shiny harmonic qualities, but for the most part, things are kept, I think, reasonably bright, while staying smooth and avoiding really ugly harmonic peaks. But back to what I was saying about the high treble, which I think is the U4S's maybe signature quality. I have a few things to say here. For one, I didn't really hear this as a tonal quality, but rather a textural quality. Strums on acoustic guitars, for example, had their more percussive, washboard-like qualities brought out of them. Sawtooth synths buzzed with a few extra teeth on them, ride cymbal transients in particular had an extra tappy sort of quality. And I can keep going, but I hope you get the point that I'm trying to make here about it being more textural than tonal. One potential drawback that I can see maybe some people complaining about is that this boosted high treble isn't entirely realistic, and I don't think that they're necessarily wrong, but I nonetheless don't really hear it this way, and appreciate the high treble emphasis for different reasons. Specifically, it made transients all across instruments just a little extra detailed and forward in the mix. I heard it as providing a heady, maybe even relaxing, sort of clicky quality, something along the lines of the physical feeling that you get when someone lightly clicks their tongue in a room after several minutes of silence. To further clarify on this high treble, no, this isn't the audio's prestige or Letchuer's cadenza. It doesn't blast your face with sizzle and air, and it's not always particularly present in a mix. However, you're going to hear it when the right parts come into play, such as the aforementioned acoustic guitars, or the cymbals, or maybe even on vocal rasp. It's really more of a consistent, uh, commonly occurring quality than a persistent quality. The only time I felt critical of this particularly forward high treble was very, very specific times on very specific acoustic snare drums, which I thought at times had maybe just a little too much scratchy snare sound present on them. However, this is more of a nitpicky sort of reviewer detail that I had to listen for, and not something that stood out to me as, you know, being straight up problematic. So overall impression here for the U4S. Honestly, I'm fairly pleased for a number of reasons. Number one being it has all of the unmistakable 64 audio fixings, despite it now being the cheapest universal IEM that the company has to offer. It has the same durable, comfortable shell, airy Tia treble, and even the wraparound behind your head sort of stage. And frequencies are um, layered like an onion. I mean, I, I actually mean this in a very good way. Uh, Bass and mids serve as a tight, driving center core that sort of grounds the stage, while high frequencies airily orbit, finding a lot of movement in their layering. The U4S is balanced without being boring, it's bright without being painful, overall pleasant, detailed, natural, and maybe most importantly, really eclectic, sounding pretty great with just about every genre I had to throw at it. Now, look, I generally agree the IEM market is insane right now, with manufacturers seemingly in a competition to release the most expensive IEMs that they can imagine. So it really is refreshing to come across something like the U4S that carries its value really, really well and offers itself as a reasonable endgame piece that, frankly, any IEM or headphone a little over $1,000 should. I'm including a link to purchase the 64 Audio U4S down below from the Audio 46 store. Uh, if you use that link to buy it, you can help the channel, which would be very nice. If you like this video and want to see more like it, remember to like and subscribe down below. And anyway, this is Chris with Major Hi-Fi, and I'll see you guys next time.